so good evening, everybody. My name is Jake Bradbeer, and tonight I'll be talking to you about metaprogramming in JavaScript. Now for the important question, what is metaprogramming? And before we answer that, we need to acknowledge that what is and isn't metaprogramming is actually a very gray area. When I was doing my research, I found more arguments than agreements on its actual definition. So you may see some things in this presentation and think, hey, that just looks like regular programming. And there'd be a lot of people who agree with you. And there'd definitely be a lot of people who disagree with you. However, the strongest definition I could find for metaprogramming is the ability of a program to read, generate, analyze, or transform other data and even modify itself. And this can be split into two main branches, the first being macros, which is the ability to generate new syntax and have it be compiled into vanilla code. So in our case, that's just going to be JavaScript. And then there's also reflection, which is the process by which a program can observe and modify its own structure and behavior at runtime. So first off, let's talk a little bit about macros. So on the, on the screen now, there's two examples of macros. Both are made using the library SweetJS, which allows users to create custom syntax. And so on the left-hand side of the screen, we're creating a new keyword named demo. Uh, this is defined using the syntax keyword and allows the developer to use demo. And at compile time, any instance of the keyword will be replaced with the code snippet provided, which in our case is just console.log hello world. And on the right-hand side of the screen, we are creating a new operator, angle, angle, equal, which is created using the operator keyword, followed by the syntax we are looking to construct. So here, we're trying to replace the existing dot then syntax. And you can see that it's used pretty similarly to dot then. Um, and then at compilation, any, any occurrence of angle, angle, equal is just going to be replaced with dot then. And these are just a couple examples of macros in SweetJS. And there are many other possibilities, as you can imagine. Um, you should definitely read about them on the SweetJS docs. There's lots of good information on there. But in general, creating macros may be useful to shorten syntax that you're using often, create new operators entirely, or even just modify existing operators. For example, you could rewrite the loose equality to be strict equality. And the second main branch of metaprogramming is reflection. And just as a reminder, reflection is the process by which a program can observe and modify its own structure and behavior at runtime. And this can be broken down into three main sub-branches, introspection, self-modification, and intercession, all of which I will get into now. But as I go through each one, I think you should all think about how you may ought to be implementing some of these techniques without even knowing that it's better programming or other ways you can achieve the same goals with existing knowledge. Yes, metaprogramming adds a ton of new functionality, it also provides more efficient ways of doing stuff that we can already do. So first of all, we have introspection, which is when code can inspect itself during runtime. So these are definitely going to look very familiar to you, but some of them are the type of operator, object.values, object.keys. Um, but there's definitely many more that you're already using. And as an example, on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see that we're declaring an object hero, which has a health backpack and weapon property. And if we invoke object.keys passing in our hero object, we receive, a, we receive an array of all the keys on the hero to object. Therefore, at runtime, we are learning something about our code. Next up, we have self-modification, which is a code's ability to change itself during runtime. On the left-hand side of the screen, we can see a function called grumpy sum, which accepts as parameters a and b. And when invoked, grumpy sum returns the sum of a and b. However, if a plus b sums to be 5, grumpy sum will actually rewrite its own function definition to always return 0. So now if we have a look at the console logs on the bottom, you can see that if we pass in 1 and 3, we're just going to return 4 as expected. If we pass in 4 and 4, we return 8 as expected. However, once we pass in 2 and 3, we trigger the if statement, which actually rewrites the function definition for every following invocation. But it's still going to return 5 for this invocation. And this is just because we're still within an execution context that has the original function, def original function definition. It is not until we leave this execution context do we start seeing a change. Now you can see that regardless of what we put in, um, the function is always just going to return 0. And the new function actually has no memory of the fact that it could ever return anything besides 0. All it knows is the new function definition. 
And lastly, we have intercession, which is code that can intercept or intervene itself during runtime. And here we're utilizing the define property method on the right hand side of the screen on the global object object to define a new property on our hero object name status. When the status property is attempting to be accessed, it will intercept the object's health property and return a string conditional on the health level of the hero. Below on, in the console logs, you can see that at full health, the hero status is just gonna return good health, but at a health level of 66, it's gonna return low health. And then if we redefine health level to be 30, we would receive critically injured. So those were just a couple examples of metaprogramming concepts that exist beyond JavaScript. Nothing we did there was exclusive to JavaScript itself, minus the syntax we used in our examples and the SweetJS library, of course. However, let's talk about metaprogramming for JavaScript specifically. And the most relevant addition is the proxy object, which was added back in the ES 2015 update. And the proxy object just allows you to create an object that can be used in place of the original but may redefine fundamental object operations such as getting, setting, um, defining properties, among others. But uh, in general, proxy objects can be used to log property accesses, validate or format data, sanitize inputs. But as you'll see shortly, the use cases are really infinite due to their modular nature. But on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see the syntax for proxy creation. And to proxy an object, you just initialize a new object set equal to the proxy constructor, which accepts as parameters the objects you are proxying, and a handler object, which stores the object operations that you're trying to overwrite. These are more commonly known as traps. So if you hear me say the word traps, or if you see it in my presentation, I'm just referring to the object operations. Here you can see an exhaustive list of the traps that your proxy may attach functionality to. I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, some important ones to highlight are get and set. This is going to trigger when a user tries to get or set any property value on the object. Apply, this one is especially interesting when you remember that all functions are objects in JavaScript, so you can actually proxy functions as well. And if you were to do that and try to invoke the proxy function, you would trigger the apply trap. So this could be useful in a variety of cases. Um, for example, if you were a developer and you wanted to see how people were using your function or how often, you could create a log of the data that developers were passing in, or you could use a counter to see how many times it's been invoked. And then next up, we have the define and delete properties. These just trigger when a user tries to either add or remove a property from the object and these could be useful in a variety of situations, but most notably, you could prevent a user from modifying the structure of the object itself. And one important thing to note um, when you're implementing traps is that these are gonna be invoked on any trigger of the trap. For example, the get property would be invoked when any property on the proxy is trying to be accessed. However, you could definitely utilize conditionals to make it specific to the property itself. We're gonna use some examples on the next slide that actually show this. But uh, lastly, it's important to realize that users would, ever, would never actually know that what they're using is a proxy unless they specifically looked at the code or your naming convention applied it. So this allows you to do a lot of sneaky things and change functionality behind the scenes. And maybe what they're seeing isn't actually what they're getting. But beyond this, there's some great information on the remaining traps on the MDN docs. I highly suggest checking them out if you do have the chance. Here you can just see a basic example that shows how proxies may be used. We first initialize our, a proxy for a game settings object, which is just initialized to have a difficulty level of hard. And this trap has, sorry, this uh, proxy has a get trap that accepts the proxy to object and the property that's trying to be accessed. And when a user tries to access a property that exists, it returns the requested value. Otherwise, it returns the string. This is just an example. So basically, what we have done here is we've redefined the undefined result that accessing a property that doesn't exist usually returns. And this is obviously not the most useful implementation of the get trap, but it does show what's possible. Um, as I said earlier, the use cases are really infinite because all you're passing in is a function definition. So you could, you could do whatever you wanted here. 
And then below is a set trap, which is triggered when a user tries to use, when a user tries to set the value of the game settings property. The trap accepts the proxied object, the property being set, and the value it is attempting to be set to. So here we can see that we're checking to see if a user is trying to redefine the difficulty level of the game. And if so, we're going to standardize that to lowercase. And then we're going to validate that the new game difficulty is one of the predefined options. So in our case, that's going to be easy, medium, or hard. And if it is not one of those, we're just going to throw an error. Otherwise, we're just going to set the property as normal. And we do this using the Reflect API. Reflect is a built-in object that provides the original functionality of the trap. And so for every trap, there exists a matching reflect method. Here, we're utilizing the set method on the reflect object, which allows us to default back to the original functionality. And if you take a look at the console logs here, you can see that when we try and access the test property, which doesn't exist, we receive, this is just an example. If we try and access difficulty, we get hard. But then if we try and redefine difficulty to easy with a capital E, we get a we get easy with a lowercase e, but if we try and set to super easy, which doesn't exist on our predefined list, then we throw our error. So why should we care about metaprogramming? For starters, metaprogramming may allow a developer to reduce code. This is helpful because it may reduce development time, it may improve readability, maintainability, but it could also decrease space complexity if used correctly. And as I mentioned earlier, some of the previous examples can be solved without metaprogramming. For example, grumpy sum can be solved utilizing closure and conditionals to see if the sum of five has been triggered. Metaprogramming really provides another solution to do this. But more importantly, metaprogramming can increase the expressivity of JavaScript. And for those that don't know, the expressivity of a language is the breadth of ideas that can be represented and communicated in that language. So in short, metaprogramming may allow us to not only do what we're doing already better, but extend the reach of our abilities. So here are just some additional resources. I would highly suggest looking at the how to use proxy objects video. Uh, proxy objects are not something you use every single day, but they can be great solutions to specific problems. And thanks for listening. I really hope you learned a lot and realized that you can utilize some of this or have already been utilizing some metaprogramming concepts into your code.